Amen. Oh, the peace to be able to say it is well with your soul amongst everything going on. That is truly valuable. Amen. And let's sing. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. So let's stand and sing it out. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Lift up your banner, let the anthems ring. Praises to our King. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Lift up your banner, let the anthem ring. Praises to our King. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is, great and mighty is, great and mighty is. Good singing. You may be seated. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, your love makes me sing. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain, firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery. How you gently lift me when I am surrounded. Your love carries me. Hallelujah. 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 Your love makes me sing. Hallelujah. 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 Your love makes me sing. Your love is surprising, and I can't feel it rising. All the joy that's growing deep inside of me. Every time I see you, all your goodness shines through. I can feel this God song rising up in me. Well, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Me sing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. to 
among men my example is he. The word became flesh and light shine among us. His glory revealed. Living he loved me. Dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far. Stretched out on a tree and then took the nails for me. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far
Well, it's good to see you back in uh, worship this morning. It's good to be back in person, isn't it? And I hope we have no more interruptions. Uh, we hope that the last time, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Let's uh, continue in worship. And since we've had a break and not been here, I just wonder if this morning you might have a We Gave It a Try story, just a brief you know, story about how you've tried to minister to someone, share Christ in some way, and whether it worked out or not, we'd love to hear it because it reminds us about putting our faith in action. And if no one has a story, that's fine. But if you have a brief word, feel free to stand. And if we don't hear you, I'll repeat it quickly. Anybody have a We Gave It a Try story you'd like to share? Okay, then we're going to go ahead and move into a time of prayer and praises and just ask you to keep in mind everyone on the uh, prayer list, pray for them, make a phone call, send a card, uh, whatever you think uh, the Lord leads you to do. And I would just like to highlight uh, a couple folks that aren't on the prayer list, but it's my understanding that Melanie is not here in worship this morning because she, I know this, she had a cousin who passed away from pancreatic cancer. And the thing about it is this is the second cousin on her side of the family that she's lost probably within two months. And so she's in Arkansas, I think, this weekend for that funeral. So keep Melody, Melanie and Mike in your prayers, if you would. So let's have a word of prayer together, and then we'll share in the Lord's Prayer. Lord, all our hope, all our strength, all our patience is really rooted in that one claim that we just sung about, that God raised you from the dead. And so even when life dishes out the worst, even when we walk through the valleys and the dark times, both personally as a society, as a church, our hope is not just in ourselves, but it's in you, the living God. And we are so thankful for that. And your love is eternal. And so it's the reason why we draw closer to you and we can bring to you our hurts, our wounds, our failures. And we can share that with you and you love us and you have no desire to condemn us or punish us. You just want to renew us and change us. And we are so thankful for that. And it's the reason why there are some folks in our prayer list that have been on the prayer list a long time. And there are new situations in our lives. And yes, sometimes it discourages us and it gets us down. But we don't stay down because of your love that is eternal. And so we lift all these names up to you, and we especially this morning remember Mike and Melanie and their travels and their family situation. And Lord, we pray for our church, and we pray as 2021 begins, you grant our leadership and all who desire to serve through the life of this church, the vision you have for how we can be a bridge to this community, how we can connect to those around us and share the greatest news of all time, and that is the good news of Jesus Christ, as we pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So our guiding verse for this series that we've been in the past few weeks has been Luke 2, 52, and it reads like this. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. I also like the way the message version translates that passage. The message Bible says this, and Jesus matured, 
growing up in both body and spirit, blessed by God and so and people. Far the messages have attempted to try and help us to consider how can we increase in our spiritual maturity? How can we grow and increase in our connection to God? And just a quick review, remind you where we've been. In week one, I think one of the key principles I just tried to put out in front of you through the message, and that is this. If the scripture says Jesus had to increase in wisdom, or that he did increase in wisdom, there's room for you and I, right? None of us should feel like we've reached our ceiling and, and we're good to go. Um, week two, we looked out at, at Acts 17, a passage there, and we looked at the story of the Bereans of when Paul brought to them the good news of Jesus. And there were some qualities about the Bereans that we lifted up so that we could have an informed faith, like they were excited to hear new understanding, and then they studied carefully what was shared with them. And then they took that, that carefulness and that caution to study, but that eagerness to learn, and they consulted with the Old Testament as they had, at that time, a, a credible source. And then they had a very informed faith about who Jesus was. And then last week, we went a little old school on you. We went to the Old Testament, the sixth chapter of the book of Nehemiah, and that great statement out of Nehemiah where when he's asked by some folks who were really trying to hinder him and stop his progress of what God had called him to do, Nehemiah said, why should I come down off this wall? I'm doing a great work. And we looked at that, and part of what we got into with that passage was just to remind ourselves that we need to have our priorities about what God calls us to do and stick with that. Well, today we're going to consider some passages that I hope do this. I hope they help us to measure our progress, whether we are increasing in our growth in Christ, our maturity in Christ, our connection to God. And one of the passages that I want to use this morning is one that you all are very familiar with out of the book of Philippians. And I would just remind you that when Paul wrote this uh, in a letter to the Christians at Philippi, um, he wasn't on sabbatical. He wasn't just pulling together his sermons of greatest hits. He was in prison when he wrote these encouraging words. And here we go from Philippians 2, verse 5. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself, and he became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And I think this is a passage of scripture to help hopefully dovetail into the rest of the message is one that we really don't need to complicate it. It's pretty simple what Paul was trying to remind the Christians at Philippi. He was trying to remind the Christians at Philippi that Jesus brought together his thinking, his mindset, and his behavior, or what he was willing to do. He, the, the attitude and the outlook of Jesus preceded what he was willing to do. He, you know, even though Son of God took on flesh, even though he was God in the flesh, he was still willing because of what he, how he thought, his mindset, his thinking, his relationship to God, innocent, but was still willing to go to the cross. He, he was still willing to serve as a slave or be a servant and sacrifice for us. So, if we want to answer the question, God, am I growing? Am I increasing in my, my maturity in you? The standard or the aim, I think, to really answer that, that question, the standard or the aim is whether our thinking, I mean, Deep down and day in and day out is our collective mindset in us, is, is our collective mindset in us, is it moving more and more? And it can happen. And it can happen. It can be simple and, 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 and but just 
make an impact. So let me give you an example. You know that I'm a big fan of Pastor Andy Stanley, and recently I've read a couple books by his, one that I'll be using probably for a sermon series, series in about two weeks. But there's a line that I've noticed that he's been using in several of his sermons, and actually it was in the one that I preached before the elections. And you might recall this, where he says, God wants you to be concerned about the you next to you, meaning don't just think of yourself. And that's just been sticking with me. And I still got room to work on that one. But it's just, it's just, it's gotten planted in my mind to try and steer me more into not just thinking of me first, but trying to think of others. Sometimes, I think what we have to be uh, careful about is we might assess our spiritual growth on the, on the wrong basis. And it sounds good. It sounds like, yeah, that, that's it. That's how I'd assess whether I'm growing in Christ, whether I'm maturing in Christ. And, and what I'm thinking of is sometimes I think the wrong assessment for whether you're growing in Christ and whether I am is, is my faith stronger? Do I believe stronger? Do I believe now more than I did yesterday, a year ago, or whatever the case may be? Because here's what I think is true. Just wrestle with this. Just consider this. But when someone just says, I believe, when I just say that, that can be so hard to measure because it's within us. And let me tell you why I'm bringing this up. There's a story out of the Gospel of Luke, and it goes like this, Luke 17. The apostles, actually the disciples, but Luke uses the word apostles here. The apostles said to the Lord, meaning Jesus, increase our faith. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. They thought they needed more. And Jesus replied, if you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would, and it would obey you. And so what do you hear Jesus trying to tell these disciples who are with the very Son of God, who by this time the transfiguration has happened, they've seen him do miracles, and they're saying, we, we want faith like you. And basically he's telling his disciples, boys, you're good enough where you are. The faith that you have is sufficient enough already. You're already there. Now, I'm not going to unpack, and I'm not going to read this scripture to you, but I'm just going to draw from it. If you, you've got it in the manuscript, you've got it on the website, if you want to follow up, you go to that story, and then you read what happens next. Jesus uses like this parable with his disciples to build on this point. And he says to them, hey, if you got slaves out in the field or servants out in the field and they come in from work, are you going to have them sit at the table and eat first or are they going to serve you? He said the servants are going to serve you first. And his point was this, that's what servants do. They fulfill their purpose. Now, why would Jesus jump into that? After telling his disciples, you've got enough faith as you already have. It seems to me this is what's going on. Jesus is letting us know to believe stronger and harder isn't always measurable. It's, it's, it's not necessarily an indicator that we're growing in Christ. So what's the indicator? And I think the indicator is... The indicator of increasing faith is being like those servants who come in from the field and then they still do what they're called to do. That's the sign of increasing faith. The half-brother of Jesus was James. And James would come along in his letter and he would say this, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but you do not have works? Can faith save? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, eat your fill, yet you do not supply their needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, it has no works. It is dead. And so I just wouldn't, I wouldn't qualify, I wouldn't try and measure my maturity in Christ 
just by how much do I believe because that's, that's hard to measure. It's, it's more about the actions we take, how we put that faith into action. Here's another caution. Also beware of this. Beware of settling for the bare minimum as a follower of Jesus. And what I mean by that is being willing to stay immature as long as we believe we're saved, as long as we think when we die we're going to go to heaven and we just have that fire insurance mentality about us. That's all I want. I just when I die, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. It's that bare minimum. There's a couple places in the New Testament this gets addressed. Paul dealt with this when he wrote to the church at Corinth, and he said this. And so, brothers and sisters, I cannot speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food. You were not ready for solid food, meaning the more deeper truth of Scripture. Even now, you're still not ready. Hebrews has a similar type of uh, statement. Hebrews 5. For by this time you ought to be teachers, meaning you shouldn't still be in a class or a small group saying, feed me more, teach me more, teach me more. You should be stepping out trying to teach others in some way. For by this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the basic elements of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is unskilled in the word of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature. And we all get this scripture, right? Don't have to even crack open a commentary for this. Because we've all been there. Infants don't do much for themselves, do they? They don't feed themselves. They don't prepare their food. They don't dress themselves. They're so dependent on those around them. And so Paul and the writer of Hebrews, they're reminding Christians, be careful not just to settle for you believe in Jesus, you accept him as your savior. You know, move beyond that. Because they weren't moving from infancy to maturity let me put it this way when we hear about people coming to churches and maybe you've heard this line of thought this phrase be used about about us all of us as Christians that sometimes we come to church and we're just consumers hearing the message did I enjoy it was it entertaining was there a little humor hearing the singing was someone off key was someone not loud enough was someone too loud yeah and we just were consumers because we're in that infancy mindset of just did I get what I want? Am I fulfilled? Am I getting my needs met? And so let me just scroll off this, you know, let me just tick off this list and then I'll move on. The, about spiritual infancy and describing that where it might fit us. It's that lacking knowledge of knowing why you believe what you believe. Well, I heard the pastor say it. I heard my Sunday school teacher say it. They must know what they're talking about. Not knowing our spiritual gifts of how God tries to use us in our day-to-day, -day, what our abilities are, needing people to minister to us instead of wondering how and trying to give back, highly sensitive and easily offended. You know, you just say something that just didn't land the right way. I bet you had other ministers besides me say this. Well, the pastor didn't speak to me this morning. And they sounded offended, right? That would be an infant Christian, or at least that part of their life. Because we're spiritually self-absorbed. And especially efforts to try and share our faith in Christ with somebody else. Minister to someone else. Tell our story. Hey, everybody's got a story. You might have had a profound conversion from drug and alcohol abuse. We all got masks on. Maybe at one time you were a bank robber and you were really comfortable with wearing a mask. Or maybe you just grew up in church. And then one day, everything the preacher said, everything you experienced at summer camp, everything that, you know, your Sunday school teacher just, just, did as good as they could to teach you it kind of clicked and that's your conversion but all of us have a story but I think what would qualify us for needing to move from infancy to maturity is if we rarely ever 
try and share that story. And you know, as I was going over the message this past week, I thought, you know, this just isn't them out there. There are some of these qualities that can maybe one is we may be mature Christians, but I still have that one hang up where I'm just living in a mature way and it just grinds on me. And it's just, I got to work on that more. So how do we move from increasing in spiritual growth or maturity? How can we take the steps to experience what Paul wrote the Philippian church and said, let this mind be in you? That even though you didn't deserve it, you laid your rights and privileges aside and you were willing to sacrifice and suffer for others. Here's what I'll close with. From 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, I think we have a couple keys that I'll just cover quickly. And the first is about we need to declutter our minds. Peter said, rid yourselves therefore of all malice and all guile and insincerity, envy, and all slander. And what Peter is just trying to say, you've got to remove from your lives the thinking, the attitudes, the convictions that are the opposite of the mindset of Jesus. You know, in last week's sermon out of Nehemiah chapter 6, won't regurgitate the point, but, you know, we did hit the, the, the idea that sometimes what holds us back is it's an inside job inside of us. And Nehemiah was determined not to get scared within himself and defeat himself by giving in to the pressure that was placed on him from the outside. But what we're hearing in these scriptures this morning, I hope you see, is that sometimes what keeps us from moving more into maturity is when we refuse to give up and release some of the ways of thinking that are less than the mind of Christ. So Peter says things like malice, which is a cruelty or meanness. He said guile, which is a word that you and I probably don't use very often in conversations, but it means to mislead, to manipulate, to deceive. And his list goes on, and it's not exhaustive. But here's what, what he is trying to get at. Look, you can't be mature in Christ. You can't be in the mind of Christ. You can't be cuddling up to the qualities of Jesus who is pure and loving and truthful and still be hanging on to all this kind of mindset uh, uh, or thinking. And once again, from the book of James, we find a little direction and help. Do you remember the scripture where James says, hey, fountain can't put out, even ask the question rhetorically, can a fountain put out both bitter water and sweet water? Well, no, it can't. And so some thinking needs to go that is inconsistent with Christ. And the second factor is by developing our awareness for the need to grow. Peter goes on and says, Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow into salvation. And I just want to stress, he says, long for the pure milk of the word. Meaning lean into the truth of God wherever you can find it. Incredible sources. You know, like a healthy baby that constantly is going to need feeding about the time you get done with the first feeding. Before you know it, you're turning around and they're hungry again. You know, have that kind of hunger, that kind of longing. Because this, I believe, is true. If we continually to seek the truth of God and we continually to take it in, it will gradually flush out, out of us. What works against God? What is the mentality in the heart that is not consistent with Jesus Christ? It's not overnight. But if we continually take in truth, God's truth will prevail. The mind of Jesus in us is the measure of our spiritual growth and maturity. And thinking like Jesus plugging into anything that can help us think like Jesus. We do that. 
we'll find the increase. God will bless with increase. That is the desire of our hearts. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord, help us to trust you enough to admit to you any way in which we think that we know is in conflict with all that Jesus was. Help us to trust your grace is greater than the darkness of our minds or our hearts. There's that Old Testament scripture that says your, re- your word will not return void. It, it will not be empty of its power. And if we take in scripture, if we absorb from one another and from those outside the church who have lived the faith and teach the faith, Your Holy Spirit will be faithful to continue to mold and shape our lives. And we will experience transformation. And Lord, wherever any reason exists in our thinking that holds us back, help us to name that even if we think we aren't ready to change it, because even if we just name it, That's the beginning of transformation in us by you. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. And I pray each and every heart here today has a desire to increase, find increase in you. Amen. Let's stand for our time of invitation and sing and reflect together and know that... uh, Anytime you need to reach out and talk, uh, maybe one-on-one in a safe space here at the church, phone, email, you let us know. Be glad to support you and, and be of encouragement to you. Well, Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. One more time. Jesus is the answer for the world today. no other Jesus is the way Jesus is the answer for the world today above him there's no other Jesus is the way Amen you may be seated we're going to move into communion we'll sing the first stands of the, of the song and then we'll have you move toward the communion trays of course keep a safe space and return to your seat and then we'll share in communion together and can it be that I should gain Interest in the Savior's blood. He died for me who caused his pain. For me, he tasted death and drank its cup. Amazing love, how can it be? 
that Jesus Christ would die for me. Amazing love, how can it be that he would die? We remember now that Jesus freely chose to lay down his life for you and me. And he did it in spite of the darkness of the world. And so that's what we focus on now. That's what we celebrate. Only him, his loving sacrifice for us. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning thankful to again be in your house. You have created us, called us, and chosen us. We, will, we want now to receive your guidance. During this difficult time, grant us ears to hear, eyes to see, and faith to respond with love. As we take this bread, let us draw strength to be faithful to do your will. There's a dear long for flowing water, so our souls thirst for you, O oh God. As from a dry and barren land where there is no water, we have come into your sanctuary to be refreshed and renewed. And here our cups are filled to overflowing with the abundance of your love. Before we call, you answer, and while we are still speaking, you are already supplying all of our needs. Thank you for the goodness and mercy that follows our steps all the way, and get especially focused for us in this cup of remembrance of Christ's death on Calvary's cross. As we are being renewed by your Spirit day by day, fill us with gratitude and prayer, we pray. Amen. And so we remember on that night when Jesus was gathered with the disciples in the upper room, he took the loaf of bread, he broke it and blessed it and gave it to them and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup of wine and after blessing it, gave it to his disciples and said, take and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. His mercy flows so rich and free His mercy flow so rich and free for all his love found me. All right, I just have one of the 
I just have one announcement this morning as we prepare to leave, and that is uh, elders who went off in 2020, and of course, all of our new elders serving in 2021, will have an elders meeting next Sunday at 2 p.m. I'll be emailing you or getting you an agenda. There's about three key things that we really need to get into, especially electing a new chair of the elders to take over from them. But I'll lead this first meeting, so that'll be next Sunday. All right. Let's be uh, mindful to uh, share our tithes and offerings as you go out in the basket, same place, same way. Let's all stand and be dismissed with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Lord, may we leave this time of worship now, renewed. Renewed especially because we came together and we remembered Jesus and his sacrifice and the love that called him to the cross and your power that raised him from the dead. And if we just remember that alone, we can step through the doors back into life and be assured that you go with us and ready to face whatever we need to face, love whomever we have the opportunity to love in your name. Amen. God bless. Have a great week.